Okay, right. Thanks. Thanks, Sri Dante. So I am uh, Dr. Srila De Silva. I am going to speak to you on uh, transport uh, uh, transport of a stabilized COVID patient from uh, one hospital to another hospital. <clears throat> so the objective of this uh, lecture is to uh, one is to understand what is retrieval and what is referring uh, referral transfers. So at the moment in our country, I think most of the transfers are referral transfers, that is hospital, referring hospital undertake the transfer of the patient to a receiving hospital. Of course, uh, uh, during this uh, transfers, we face challenges and deficiencies. So the challenges and the deficiencies in our system are uh, basically during stabilization and preparation for the transport of a patient and problems during the transport and at the handover. So we will go through all these uh, areas one by, uh, one by one during this uh, lecture. Now, uh, if you take the deficiencies and challenges, uh, the one of the issues is the shared care uh, when you decide that the patient should be transferred from hospital A to hospital B, uh, there should be a simple shared care, which means the, the referring hospital and the receiving hospital should make a dialogue and make decisions on how best the patient could be transferred from patient hospital A to hospital B. Uh, I think this is not happening. Uh, right now, in most of the transfers, we have to make a culture to make it happen. Then the, there is a movement and safety issues. Uh, when you lift the patient from the patient bed to the ambulance stretcher, the patient can get destabilized because the patient is quite stable in the patient's bed in the referring, the, the referring hospital. So the moment you lift the patient from the patient bed, to the ambulance bed, there are safety issues because the patient get desaturated, because there are a lot of equipments around the patient that need to be carefully uh, dismantled and then refixed onto the ambulance stretcher. And of course, uh, uh, sometimes there are resource limitations. When, you, when the ambulance start moving, there are only a couple of people in the ambulance who can undertake uh, if there's a problem inside the ambulance. So, which means we have to have a plan. Uh, we have to have a we have to have a troubleshooting. How to troubleshoot the problems that you are going to face inside the ambulance. Then um, uh, there are a lot of unfamiliar equipments in the ambulance. So, if you have not been to ambulance before, if you have not gone in the ambulance before, the sometimes the equipment may be not familiar. Even if you have gone in the ambulance, you have done the transfers before. There sometimes this particular ambulance, there may be equipments which are not very familiar for you. Therefore, before you get into the ambulance, you have to make sure that the ambulance, the equipments are familiar to you. If they are not something new, you need to operate and see how you uh, how you operate these um, equipments, uh, how we operate these equipments and then see. Okay, sorry. Then um, uh, the other other issue or the other challenge is uh, uh, the clinical isolation. So when you shift the patient from the uh, patient bed into the ambulance into the ambulance stretcher and you start moving, then probably you might get stuck in the hospital uh, hospital lift, uh, and then the, you might have no help. Uh, on the other hand, there sometimes the, you might get uh, stuck on the way because of the mechanical problem in the ambulance and where there is no help. So you get uh, clinically isolated. So you need to, you need, you should be prepared to face this type of situations uh, when you uh, undertake a transfer from A to B. Then the other issue is physical and physiological changes. What do you mean by that? When the ambulance start moving, the, some of the you know the drivers sometimes they charge on the wrong lane in, in on the road, and sometimes they accelerate and de decelerate the ambulance because they want to get into the 
uh, hospital B as uh, much as quickly as possible. So these acceleration deceleration forces can can make physiological changes in the patient and and can adversely affect the uh, patient's hemodynamic. So this is also something that you need to remember when you uh, when you undertake a patient uh, from hospital A to the hospital B. So this uh, the pneumonic is uh, this is the pneumonic. So it stands for shared care. The C stands for clinical isolation. R stands for resource limitation. U stands for unfamiliar equipment. And M stands for movement and safety. And P stands for physical and psychological changes. Right. The, now, when you, when you undertake a trans uh, as a transport team, uh, the, you are the most important person in, that, uh, in, in the ambulance, not the patient. Why I am saying you are the most important as a healthcare person. You have a family. You need to get into. You need to go home at the end of the day, and you should get uh, infection from the patient. So you should get infected from the patient. Therefore, you should be prepared for that. You have to have a proper personal protective equipment before you get into the before you undertake this type of transfers. So what are the essential essential or mandatory personal protective equipments? One is in 95 mask, then face shield, then surgical gown, and the gloves. But I think the Ministry of Health has provided much more than that. The head cap, the shoe covers, and uh, cover for all, and a hood, you know, the etc. So that, but out of that, I think what is most important thing is in 95 yeah. mask, the face shield, a surgical gloves, a surgical gown, and the gloves. So now, uh, once you are equipped, once you have, uh, once you have ready with, uh, once you have worn your personal protective equipment, you need to, you need to undertake the transfer. Now you have to make a risk assessment before you undertake the transfer because each transfer is different from one to another. So, you need to make sure mm -hmm. the patient's safety, uh, interesting the patient's safety. You need to understand the patient's condition uh, and uh, and uh, and indication for transfer, and you have to balance it. Where are you going, and how long it takes, and the environment in the ambulance, and the, your skills. So you need to make sure you are actually taking the right patient at the right time by the right people and to the right place and by the right form of transport and making the right environment and receiving right care throughout. So this is a bit of a difficult decision to make before you undertake the transfer, but it's important that each patient, you have a, have a clear idea before you undertake, that if you take that patient to your ambulance. Now you need to have a clear idea on the, based on the evaluation of the patient. So you need to find out from the referring hospital and also the receiving hospital, whether this transfer is urgent or time critical. Very often, if you have stabilized this patient properly, uh, there shouldn't be an urgent transfer. There should be time critical transfers. So you have to can take your own time if patient is properly stabilized. And you need to decide both receiving hospital and the uh, referral hospital should decide how best this patient could be stabilized before you undertake the transfer. <laughs> and the staff, you uh, and the staff, refer, the transport staff, the doctors and the nurses, uh, their experience, their competencies <coughs> in handling this type of a transfer. And also, what type of equipment that you need to uh, you need to uh, carry in order to uh, have a uh, effective, uh, successful transfer to the receiving end, and the mode of transport. So very often in our country, the mode of transport is by the ambulance. So the ambulance should be a, a proper ambulance with fully equipped ambulance, and where there. Uh, where there are uh, where, where there are equipments in case of emergency. And the most important other most important thing is effective communication. 
the referring hospital and the receiving hospital should make effective communication on the ISPA format and make sure that the message is clearly gone to the receiving hospital what is expected out of from uh, is expected out of the receiving hospital on this patient and also don't forget that the documentation is important so what are the documentation that you need to carry uh, in order to uh, give all the details of this patient to the receiving end <clears throat> maybe the uh, maybe the bed uh, ticket maybe the trans uh, uh, transfer notice or the transfer form maybe the referral letter from the, the referral hospital and uh, maybe x-rays or maybe images like uh, CT scans or the ultrasound scans that you need to carry all these things with you in in order to make in order to hand in order to make sure that the patient is properly handed over to the receiving end then since we are transferring covid patients um, we need to understand a little bit of covid i think we probably would have gone through this uh, 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 lecture before during the training but just to refresh your mind recollect what you have learned during that time the covid the problems are uh, this is this is significant vascular disease with where there is a microthrombi formation in the in the lungs and also in the uh, uh, arteries in the lung arteries and veins in the lung so this can also lead to increased vascular permeability so therefore there is a there is a leak fluid leak and as well as microthrombi causing obstruction to the flow of the blood into the lungs and to the other organs as well. And this causes diffusion limitations of the gas and causing diffuse lung disease. And this leads to ventilation perfusion mismatch uh, and also the right to left shunt when it comes to uh, worse cases. So these changes are basically similar to typical adult respiratory distress syndrome. Now the slide, the this uh, picture on the right side is the early stages of the COVID infection where there are, this is a CT scan report, you find that there are white dots. So which means that this, uh, the disease process is settling, they're starting to settle. So there are microthrombi here, which actually, <laughs> which actually uh, disturb, which actually prevent the proper gas exchange and making the patient hypoxic. And it can advance to the stage when it advances to this stage, very often they need uh, they they need um, uh, high oxygenation support to make the saturations go in, and it's very difficult to transfer this type of patients because the patients can succumb, patients can die on the way, and uh, this is then the patients start recovering. So that's what I said at the beginning. You need to understand your patient. You need to do a risk assessment. You need to find out the degree of the patient uh, uh, before you undertake the transfer and what type of problems that you might have, might face during the transfer to the receiving hospital. And we also know in COVID patients, there is a, a principle called uh, pronounced hypoxia without showing signs of respiratory distress. Since this uh, microthrombi happening in the arteries and the veins around the lungs the patient might be hypoxic and without showing respiratory distress which we called uh, called as silent hypoxemia so this you have to remember very you have to remember you have to remember because uh, uh, if you underestimate this uh, concept the if the patient deteriorates and very often will be pronounced death uh, the, when you re, when you come when you uh, reach the receiving hospital, now depending on this uh, the pathology, you might have to the start on the decide on the type of the oxygenation that you provide uh, for the patient. So, what is the type of the pro oxygenation that you provide? One is either you can you can find out whether you can manage it nasal tone, simple nasal tone oxygen, or then you need to find out whether you can manage the, uh, the fixed mass, simple face mask oxygen device like this it should be tight face mask like this. And also with the, this patient needs uh, like venturi oxygenation, oxygenation to the venturi mask. 
venture devices, and also uh, otherwise whether the patient needs non-free breathing mass or oxygenation. So all these devices, how do you find out whether you, the oxygen flow that you provide from the cylinder is good enough? So it's basically by the saturation. So you have to make the saturation stable with whatever the devices. So if a nasal prone doesn't work, then you need to move on to simple face mask. If that doesn't work, if facilities are available, you might try venture having devices. If that fails, I think you need to go for uh, non breathing mask devices to in order to optimize the oxygen, uh, in order to optimize the oxygen delivery. So the saturation is important. So it's important that saturation probe is um, uh, is put onto the patient by yourself, because sometimes the way you put the saturation probe to the patient might make a big difference. Because uh, some, you know, sometimes the doctors, some some of our staff don't want to touch the patient. You get somebody else to put the saturation probe. No, that's not right. I think you have to put the saturation probe by yourself properly, the correct way, and in order to make sure that the saturation is recorded. So if saturation is recorded like 98, you have to make sure if it is properly placed, <clears throat> then you can actually uh, see the pulse wave on the monitor. If there are good pulse wave, that means that your saturation probe is properly, properly placed. Then how do you find out? Uh, how do you find out whether the amount of the oxygen, how do you decide the amount of the oxygen for different devices? So this is, uh, uh, this is again one of the slides that uh, we have probably seen during the training, uh, initial lectures. So if you, wish, if you use simple face mask, uh, simple face mask, your minimum flow is five liters. Don't use less than five liters for a minimum face mask. And maximum flow you can use is 10 liters. With that, you are trying to achieve the oxygen delivery around 40 to 60% on the patient. When you use Venturi mask, there are different colors of Venturi, face, uh, Venturi uh, devices, and you're trying to achieve the oxygen delivery between 25 to 60%. Now, if you use non-breathing mask, the minimum oxygen flow is 10 liters. Remember, please remember, because don't use less than 10 liters in a non-breathing mask. You are not giving adequate oxygenation, and patient will get hypoxic. And also, if the patient is desaturated, even with 10 liters, you can go up to 15 liters through the non breathing mass. And you are trying to achieve the oxygenation 60 to 95 percent with these devices. Now, if that fails, you know, as I told you, the pathology is getting worse. The there's lung pathology is getting worse and causing the patient hypoxic. So, in that case, you need to give you need to get on to the high flow oxygen devices. The high flow oxygen devices delivers oxygen with some pressure, with some seat up effect into the patient. So the minimum flow that can need to start is two liters per kilogram per minute. And the maximum flow that you need to go is 60 liters per minute. So it's quite a high amount of oxygen is consumed in the high flow oxygen therapy. And you are targeting to deliver oxygen saturation around 95%. So this is what I'm trying to say. Uh, we need to decide, we need to decide, to, you need to decide to transfer a patient, COVID patient, before they require high flow oxygen therapy. The patient who is in high flow oxygen therapy is very difficult to transfer uh, smoothly to the receiving hospital because patient get hypoxic because the, the maximum that you can do deliver in the ambulance, it's non the mass oxygen, which is about 10 to 15 liters and gives 60 to 90% uh, oxygenation in the patient. Now in COVID patients, uh, how do you place the oxygen mass? Uh, I think uh, this is um, the surgical mass. Um, so the better, better way of um, first fix the oxygen mass, the simple oxygen mass or the non breathing mass, and, and you need to put the surgical mask on top of that. So there are a lot of advantages, a couple of advantages by doing this. 
So the simple oxygen devices, simple face mask or the non-treated mask and put the face surgical mask on top of that. By doing that, you're actually trying to prevent the aerosol generation. So this is the, uh, this is the simple face mask and this is with the nasal prone and this is the high flow. You can see when you do that, the, the, the oxygen, uh, the viral, uh, uh, viral spread into the environment in the exhale here yeah, is lot less. Therefore, this is uh, this uh, causes uh, uh, this uh, this causes uh, minimum spread of viral spread to the environment, and also it causes CPAP effect because uh, it causes the pressure to build up in the lungs with the amount of oxygen that you deliver. So it causes. So your target is to maintain the saturations during the transfer more than 96%, 96%. And uh, <coughs> you can, of course, <coughs> monitor the saturation with the uh, pulse oximeter during the transfer. Now, a uh, little bit on the, the non-treated mass. Non-treated mass has a reservoir like this. It has oxygen reservoir. And you need to, uh, you need to inflate this uh, reservoir bag with oxygen before you put onto the patient. So this is one of the important things. You need to inflate this bag with the oxygen, connect with the oxygen cylinder and inflate the bag. And then you need to put onto the patient. So when you put onto the patient, when the patient inhale, the oxygenation goes through a one-way valve system to the patient. But when you exhale, it doesn't get into the bag because of the one way valve, it, it, uh, it, uh, it gets out of the uh, mass. So therefore, you can actually deliver 60 to 95% of oxygen delivery in the patient. So this is one of the important practical, uh, uh, practical issues uh, and that you need to consider when you use high, uh, when you use non treatable mass to patients uh, for oxygen delivery. Now, this is the patient who requires much, uh, this, is, this is a patient much worse than that and who require very high oxygenation with a bit of pressure, high pressure. So it's uh, either you can use it CPAP or you can use it high flow nasal oxygen. So this is the high flow nasal oxygen catheter and this is the high flow machine. So unfortunately, when the patient comes to this stage, it's very difficult to transfer uh, in the ambulance because there's no provision for us to use uh, this high flow machine, connect the high flow machine to the ambulance. Uh, therefore, you can't give high flow machine, high flow oxygen, uh, high flow oxygen in the in the ambulance. That's what I'm. That's what I said. You need to decide to transfer a patient before they deteriorate uh, to the uh, to the level where they require high flow oxygen therapy for the patients. Now, um, when you decide. Uh, the patient need to go to hospital B, uh, the, there should be a communication. The communication should be based on ISBA format. So that means uh, you need to identify the uh, situation, uh, background of the patient, assessment of the patient, and decide on the recommendation. So both referring hospital and receiving hospital should make a dialogue. The receiving hospital should call the receiving hospital and you have to identify the doctor who is calling from the referring hospital to the doctor who is calling the receiving hospital. You need to take down the contact telephone number of the uh, referring hospital doctor and also the receiving hospital doctor because uh, it might need later on in case that we need to get some advice, you should know whom you have spoken to, uh, spoken to before. So what you should uh, discuss, you should discuss the patient's biodata, name, age, and the, the problem, the reason for transfer, uh, whether you need to, uh, uh, what you need to, uh, you, uh, what you need to do to establish the patient and what have you done so far, and the, uh, uh, the effect of what you have done so far. And you need to both hospitals, uh, doctors, and the nurses should agree on a summarized plan to make sure the patient is safely transferred from A to B. Then a little bit on preparing packages before you uh, transfer. 
So before you transfer again, when the patient still is in the patient's bed, you have to go through airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure, and also the glucose. So make sure the glucose is normal. And if possible, <coughs> you can probably do a blood gas before you, uh, 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 at this stage, before you lift the patient from the patient's bed. And also try to understand what type of organ support this patient is on. And also try to understand the patient. There may be other comorbidities in this patient, maybe copulmonary, maybe heart failure, maybe diabetes, maybe other issues. So try to understand the physiological therapeutic reserve in this patient, whether they can stand this, uh, this can, whether they can stand the trip or the transfer to the receiving hospital. And uh, uh, make sure how to secure this patient to the trolley and then how to secure the trolley to the ambulance. And also it's important that you carry some blankets uh, because ambulance is sometimes air conditioned. A patient might feel a bit cold and hypothermic. Therefore, you need to carry some blanket to make the patient uh, warm. The most important thing is, since depending on the oxygen devices you use and depending on the oxygen flow you use, you need to find out how much or how many cylinders that you need to carry in the ambulance. So uh, depending on the size of the cylinders that can vary and the distance that you need to travel. So you need to get in touch with your anesthesia colleague in the hospital uh, and try to uh, and ask them how much oxygen, how many oxygen cylinders do I need to carry uh, in order to safely reach the, the receiving hospital. So general principle is when you calculate the, the, you need to take twice of the calculated amount of oxygen in the ambulance in, uh, before you depart from the, uh, before you depart from the referring hospital. Then um, uh, you need to check a lot of things before you start the journey. So the oxygen, the mask, self filtering bag, resuscitator, suction equipments, intubation equipments, pulse oximeter, uh, epinephrine, muscle reaction, like drug. So there are a lot of things to remember. It's very difficult to remember everything in your head before you start the journey. So you need to have something like this, something like the checklist. So uh, basically we have prepared in the College of Pediatrician, we have prepared a small checklist where the people will have to fill up before, you, before they start the journey. So this is number of uh, name of the referring hospital, receiving hospital, and the contact number, then the transport doctor, the transport nurse, the patient's age, and patient's comorbid issues, uh, uh, and, and whether it is a medical problem or surgical problem, and the reason for the request, and the clinical details, and the history and the examination, and the management findings in very brief, and the reason for transfer. There's an empty column here. And on the back side, you have to write down uh, whether the respiratory rate, the chest expansion, AI entry, the saturation, uh, whether saturation, uh, what is the saturation breathing in air and with the face mask and amount of the oxygen, whether it's nasal drone oxygen and other devices, uh, whether the NG tube and cervical spine protection, back balance ventilation. So this is basically general for the general patients, not for COVID patients. Basically, we need to find it for the COVID patients and the ET tube. And the, this is on the circulation parameters, perfusion, and the peripheral IV access and the other secretary support and the urinary catheters. This is on the, the central nervous system, uh, disability, AVPU scale, and the posture, and the pupils, and the blood sugar, and the temperature, and, and the dentures. So if the patient is on a ventilator or the oxygen support, you need to write down the details of that. And the equipment check, this is something important before you get into the ambulance. I have told, I have already stressed that you need to carry the double the amount of oxygen that you might use on the way. So the number of oxygen cylinders, then the battery backup, you have to check the battery backup of the pulse oximeter because otherwise, pulse oximeter, uh, if not connected to the ambulance, might, uh, might die on the way by, and, um, and then you might not uh, have a saturation monitor. Then um, AED, auto, uh, uh, automated external defibrillator, then the suction machine, and also the other medications that we have prepared 
so uh, we don't have a we don't have a, uh, a the, like a document like this at the moment so i think it's important that we try to introduce this type of document so that uh, we have a checklist before we start the journey from the referring hospital to the receiving hospital so moving the patient from uh, uh, from the patient bed to the ambulance stretcher uh, it's again a, uh, it's again a bit of a job because uh, it should be done coordin uh, well coordinated it should be a well coordinated job the team leader should be in charge and he should give very clear instructions and how to move this patient and how to uh, uh, disconnect what are the equipments around and how to reconnect those equipments to the uh, equipment to the ambulance uh, the ambulance trolley stretcher so that uh, the, everything is stable the patient is made stable during the uh, during this uh, during, during this uh, during the transfer from the patient's bed to the ambulance bed then inside the ambulance once you load the patient to the ambulance it's important that you make the patient comfortable like this and make sure that the patient is oxygenated well and always consider patient safety and also your safety. So they obviously it's not safe because he's not wearing the full PPE. And also make sure that uh, this oxygen cylinder is properly placed. Now this type of oxygen, this is not safe at all. Uh, might uh, cause, uh, you know, might fall and cause problems. Therefore make sure that this is quite safe and patient is comfortable. So patients should be transferred in the best possible condition inside the ambulance. And also, if them, this is all air conditioned, so if you have facilities, you can open the windows. And in the COVID patients, make sure that you open the windows so there's a free flow of gas, a free flow of air uh, through the uh, uh, backside of the ambulance. Um, so, you need to remember that uh, uh, any hospital is better than back of an ambulance. So, therefore, you have to, you have to take this patient uh, as soon as possible. Uh, to the receiving hospital uh, without uh, making a compromise. Now, what? how do you monitor this type of patients in the ambulance? So you have to monitor the, you have to always look at the saturation monitor, the multiparameter. But I'm going to look at saturation, saturation, the patient. Then pulse rate and uh, pulse rate, uh, you can monitor pulse rate here. And then a non, uh, uh, non-invasive blood pressure monitoring. And also trying to observe whether the speed rate is going down or the speed rate is increasing. And also try to have a judgment on the level of consciousness. So if the level of consciousness is deteriorating, that means patient is getting hypoxic. So uh, very often the pulse oximeter or the multiparameter is on the back of the ambulance and you have to sort of turn the patient, turn the multiparameters towards you. And how do you know that the saturation is dropping? It's important that you set the alarms in the multipara monitor before you start the journey. This is very, very important. So that otherwise you never know what is going to happen till you reach the receiving hospital and patient get hypoxic and patient might even die, pronounced death on, on, on uh, admitting to the receiving hospital. So when the patient, when the, it is alarming, uh, then you know that you need to escalate the oxygen therapy. You have to escalate the oxygen therapy, and also you need to have a proper communication during the, uh, during the transfer, uh, whether to communicate with your referring hospital or receiving hospital, you have to decide, you have to have a uh, consensus, you have to speak to the consultants and then take a decision about it. Then uh, during the transfer, if you think the patient is deteriorating, the respiratory rate is either going up or respiratory rate is less than eight per minute is going to have a respiratory arrest. So in that case, I think you probably need to give bag wear mask ventilation inside the ambulance. So uh, as I mentioned before, you have to make sure you have minimal aerosol generation during bag wear mask ventilation. So you have to do double-handed jaw thrust, double-handed jaw thrust by one person. Uh, to make sure that the oxygen, uh, of the mask is kept sealed and prevent aerosol generation. And the second person is actually ambuing the patient and making the lungs recruited so that uh, the, you try to maintain the oxygenation until you reach the uh, destination. 
Then what are the problems uh, in the trans uh, during the transfer inside the ambulance? The problems, as I said uh, before, the patient's alveoli can keep collapsing and make the patient hypoxic. So this is one of the problems that can happen and that has happened in, in, during the transfers. So if that is not sorted out, that can lead to hypovolemia and that can cause uh, circulatory insufficiency and shock. And also I said, if you forget to take blankets with you, patient can get hypothermic inside and, pay, and, and that also can cause, make the condition worse. And also the, I told you to check the blood sugar before you start the journey. Uh, otherwise hypoglycemia is another issue that can happen. Then all, all these factors can make the patient's metabolic disturbances worse. You can make the acidosis worse and can ultimately lead to uh, seizures and multi-organ failures inside uh, before they reach the receiving hospital. So what are the factors contributing to the, the issues of poor, uh, poor monitoring and, in, uh, and uh, ineffective interventions in the ambulance? Maybe the lighting, poor lighting in the ambulance. Maybe there are a lot of vibration in the ambulance. Uh, uh, maybe the road is not good. Maybe the ambulance driver is not good. Uh, maybe the temperature, as I said, because communication is difficult because you need to call your consultant and also you need to do a lot of interventions inside the ambulance, which is sometimes very difficult. Uh, and also the monitoring, uh, uh, monitoring of these patients. Uh, the, if you are not, if you are not placed the monitor cap to you, uh, uh, cap, uh, monitor the proper place, then you can't see what's happening with the patient. Uh, and also sometimes the, you, um, um, the, as healthcare persons, you might get sick by sitting in the ambulance. You might start vomiting and you might lose your concentration power to manage this patient. So therefore it's important that you sort of, you get sick, you have motion sickness, you take uh, uh, anti-emetic before you get into the ambulance so that you reach the, you, you reach the destination uh, without much issues. Then other factors is the uh, need to decide what time should you set off. We start your journey from referral hospital to the receiving hospital. So it depends on the nature and severity of the illness, the urgency of the transfer. You had an idea about the, what, what is the mobilization time, <clears throat> the geographical factors, whether there are landslides and uh, whether the road is not good uh, and whether the, uh, uh, whether there's a floods or whether there the are thunders, the storms, or weather conditions, and also when you reach the when you reach the city, you need to avoid the uh, peak traffic times because if you get into a traffic time like this, then you probably will be stuck in the traffic and delay the delay in reaching the uh, hospital. So you have to avoid the traffic times when you reach the city. Then when you come to the hospital, uh, sometimes you have not been to the hospital before. This is the first time you have come to this hospital and uh, maybe the driver may be new, uh, maybe the ambulance crew may be new. So you should know where you are going because uh, very often for COVID patients, there's a separate entrance uh, for most some of the hospitals or most of the hospitals and uh, you need, should know where you are going. So that's what I told you, you have to carry the telephone mobile number of the of the doctor in the receiving hospital so that you can actually call and find out. And also it's a good idea to inform him before you depart. Say I'm departing at this time from the referral hospital and this is my expected time of arrival to your hospital so that they are ready. Uh, and also make sure once you come there, we are to land, which gate to take, which entrance to, uh, which entrance to enter, uh, and take the, take the patient through and to reach the unit that uh, the patient is waiting for. So these, all these things matter a lot. Uh, so don't, you don't have to take the patient to the OPD and go through the MOPD admission counter because the patient is quite ill. You, you don't have to go through all these red tapes. You can take the patient straight into the place where they are waiting for the patient, but you can do other uh, uh, registration and other administrative issues uh, later on. So how do you handle and, and, and uh, Donnie and Dauphin? So how do you try handle? 
the, the once the patient is re once patient reach the receiving unit, it's important that you make the patient stable in the receiving unit, uh, and also uh, try the continue to monitor and make sure the patient is stable and help to resuscitate if patient needs some kind of resuscitation, and give a comprehensive handover to the receiving team. The receiving team means doctors and nurses of the ambulance. Uh, ambulance um, transport team should hand over to the doctors and nurses in the receiving unit. Uh, we have very often have observed that the doctors uh, hand over to, to a doctors in one corner, nurses hand over to a nurses in one corner. So there is no coordinated job. This shouldn't happen. The doctors and nurses all uh, should hand over as a team to the receiving hospital doctors and nurses. And also don't forget to hand over the other documents, the, the transfer form, the referral letters, and the imaging and other investigations. And at the end of that, make sure the patient's stable, make sure the patient is registered in that hospital and help them to register the uh, patient in the, and uh, make sure uh, the bystanders are they are comfortable, they are made comfortable before you leave. And then you remove your, uh, you remove your uh, personal protective equipment and dispose at the correct bins, and and and, uh, and you are not getting contaminated by doing this uh, by removing this personal protective equipment. So you need to follow the hospital policies, uh, infection control policies in performing this job. Um, so finally, this is the last slide. So transporting patients from uh, A to B, referring hospital receiving hospital is not. It's not very simple. So you need to decide on the transfer and you need to, uh, there should be a coordinating center uh, where they coordinated the transfer, the receiving hospital. The ambulance uh, should be well equipped with the crew of what the, the, the ambulance team, transport team should know what they are supposed to do and the troubleshoot and clearly document uh, the, the things that happens during the transfer and then uh, handle these records to the receiving hospital. Uh, and also there should be a body who probably govern, who probably go through these records and trying to identify, uh, trying to uh, go through these statistics, uh, going go through this. Uh, so what are you trying to learn out of this uh, feedback? You have to find out what worked well and what areas to improve. And we had to always practice no blame culture if there are issues. Uh, you need to uh, find out why it happens and try to improve the system rather than trying to blame the people in the in the ambulance crew. So the way forward is uh, to ha have a retrieval uh, retrieval uh, by a trained professional is the best form of transport. So we need to create a retrieval concept. We need to create retrieval teams in order to make sure the patient is safely reaching the receiving hospital. So uh, this, if you have any questions, uh, you can actually ask me or I put it into the chat box. Uh, otherwise I can go to the summary slides. Uh, thank you, sir, so, for that informative lecture. And uh, yeah, we'll I will do the summary also, then we can go through. Uh -huh. okay, so in summary, so use proper personal protective equipment, consider risk benefit of the patient transport, careful planning and preparation is important. So ambulance with proper equipment is important and clear communication between the referral and receiving hospital and the, between the team members uh, and also anticipate the problem before you start the transfers and always use a checklist because there's a lot to remember. Okay, so thank you. Thank, thank you. So if you have any questions, I can answer. Okay, Dilante. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much for that informative lecture. I think uh, only